Next, we have a panel discussion, and we will have Miguel Joller and Brent Phillips. Uh, you guys can actually make your way up if you're ready. Um, and Galena will be moderating this panel discussion. So a little bit about Brent Phillips. He is a project manager with Humanitarian AI, developing data sets to train artificial intelligence applications designed for humanitarian aid. In the past, he has worked with the United Nations, Amazon, and Mercer. And Miguel Joller um, is a professor at UC Davis and is spearheading the Sustainable Freight Initiative, whose goal is to provide foundational knowledge that will impact the future decisions of goods, transportation services, and he'll actually do a short presentation about that before our discussion. So let's welcome up Miguel Joller. I'm Miguel Joller. I'm a faculty at UC Davis I'm from Columbia. And I have been working on um, kind of disaster response logistics and humanitarian logistics for the last 11, 12 years from the research perspective. So one of the uh, things that I do is every time there is a disaster, I try to be there when it's safe and when my work will be valuable. Uh, the type of work that I do is going in there, see what happened, see what worked, what didn't work and then coming out of the disaster and trying to uh, develop policies or plans to improve the planning, to improve the preparedness, to improve the mitigation, and the response itself. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about, as Galina already mentioned, one of the problems that is also known as the second tier disaster. So <clears throat> look at these images and think a little bit about what comes to your mind. What do you feel? What do you want to do? Help. So some people may not feel anything. anything. That's totally fine. We are bombarded by information from many, many disasters and many, many events around the world. Some of them may spark some light in our hearts. Some of them may not. But in essence, if you find that you want to help, how will you do it? You can volunteer, but if the event is in the middle of nowhere and you are here in Stanford, you may not be, go and be able to contribute, be able to volunteer in person. So there's some sort of substitution of that help that you want to do. And that substitution is donating. And you can donate either money, you can donate time, you can donate in-kind donations, as Galina was mentioning. However, many people don't know what to donate, where to donate it, how to donate it. And let me show you what are the results of those behaviors. This is from the Gulf Coast after Katrina. A lot of donations just ending out in the streets. Warehouses and warehouses filling by the minute. Nowhere to put them no resources to handle them, not even how to distribute them. Colombia floods about 80% of the country, what is a, in a state of disaster about in 2010. We get a lot of donations of things that are not needed, tire customs. We have carnivals and people think that after a disaster that's what people need. <laughs> Spanish flags, use mattresses, use underwear, you name it. Joplin, Missouri, 2011, there was a tornado coming in, and uh, kind of 20, 30% of the, of the town got uh, destroyed. When we went there, this is what you see on the streets. Donations are just piling up on the streets. Some organizations, they don't have the manpower to handle them. They end up kind of bailing them. They go to a third world country and they just get about 20 cents per pound or per kilo. And it probably took about $3 to get that same pound to Joplin. Our locations that you visit the warehouses, they were full of water. And you may think, okay, there's a disaster, everybody needs water, so we start donating water. But water is one of the things that gets reestablished in many disasters really fast, except Puerto Rico at the moment. But you will go to every single warehouse and full of donations. Hurricane Sandy, again, if you drive around uh, 
Long Island, you will see that every corner, every space was just full of donations. Haiti, the same. People sending seats that are needed, not suitable, food that was already expired. People said that donations were hard to control, a lot of inappropriate donations. About 80% of clothing donations were useless. In disasters, or large-scale disasters, clothing is one of the most donated items. However, as you can point this out, about 80% of them is useless. However, you go to a donation center, you go to a, a distribution center after a disaster, more than 50% of the people of the staff is working on handling this donated clothing, putting them in racks, organizing them by size, by color. Uh, the problem is that only about 10 to 15% of the remaining 20% get all, gets ever distributed. So those same resources could have been used to handle more priority or higher priority donations. Had Japan, 50% of everything that was donated was not good. 70% was no uh, priority. Too many blankets. What's the problem, again, in, in donations? And I think Elena pointed this out. We know there is a disaster. We know now uh, the fires in Northern California. And we think people lost everything, or many people lost everything. And then we start sending stuff. However, by the time those items arrive, they may not be needed anymore. They may be already moved out of the area. They may be in temporary shelter that's not needed. What happened in Japan? Well, the, the news started coming in. It was at the end of the, of the winter. And we saw images of people kind of with really cold. So a lot of blankets were sent in to respond to the disaster. However, by the time the blankets came in, now the weather changed, the blankets were not needed anymore. And there were just warehouses and warehouses piling uh, blanket donations. Broken bikes. Sometimes people think that a disaster is the time to empty the closets, empty all the garbage they have. And it's not only people. There is also corporate donations that are not useless. Donations from, from time, sometimes from corporate may be those inventories of failed products. The company came from an idea of selling uh, pineapple coconut water. They got productions of many, many liters. It didn't work, and they have 3,000 packages standing in the warehouse. Oh, there's a disaster. Let's donate this coconut pineapple water. And they get some tax breaks or tax benefits from it. Again, more from Joplin. More from Joplin. Every, everywhere you go, you will see just warehouses just full of donations. More water. What happens? They need space to handle the priority donations. They start getting out the non-priority donations. Valparaiso fires in Chile. Again, many pieces of clothing with not purse, use lipsticks, a lot of, I don't know why people think they can send half empty soap bottles or shampoo bottles to disasters. The beneficiaries, they don't need that. Now in Harvey, still, this is just a, some example of the news, Americans are sending too much stuff to Houston. Sometimes we don't call it donations, we just call it stuff. So donations, in general, I'll call the second tier disaster. Why? The disaster happens, and then the responding organizations have to deal with the second tier, the second wave of disasters. So how do we prioritize? How do we call different type of goods that get donated to a disaster? Well, first, we have the high priority goods. Those are the goods that are going to be needed at the moment, that are in high demand. Then we have low priority, that may be those goods that will probably be needed, but not now. And because they are not needed now, somebody has to store them, somebody has to keep them, and that detracts some resources from handling the high priority goods. However, we have the non-priority, and it's everything that is sent that is inappropriate, 
If it's good, it could be expired, it could be damaged, or they could come to some location without any destinatary. Let me give you an example. Let's say last month with the fires, somebody in your town said, okay, I'm gonna donate the time of a truck and the truck will be at the door of the church. Please bring your donations to the truck. The truck will leave Friday and go to Sonoma or Santa Rosa. And then everybody in the Goodwill start filling up this truck of stuff that nobody knows, probably in black bags, that's what you found. And then that truck is sent on Friday to Santa Rosa. The truck goes, tries to find somebody to receive the cargo, but every time the truck stops, say, oh, I'm bringing donations. What do you need? What do you, where are you bringing? Well, I don't know, just full of donations. No, we, we are not receiving that type of donations. Go to the next one. And they start going and going and going and going and going. At the end of the day, the driver has two options. Either come back with the cargo, because he didn't know where to drop it, or find a place to drop it. And most likely, he'll find an open space and drop the cargo. Or you have some initiative, he will stop in a corner, open kind of a distribution point, but, it, but at the end of the day, whatever's left, it will be left there, it will be left there. And what happens the next day, those donations are still there, it starts raining, those donations start to get kind of a healthy hazard. And that happens over and over and over and over and over again. So the goodwill intentions of people trying to donate may end up having a negative impact on the response. Different estimates from the different disasters we have visited is that between 50 to 70% of everything that is sent to disasters is non-priority from the in-kind donations part. So what can we actually do? Well, we have been working on trying to change donations management from a reactive kind of response to the donation tsunami to something more proactive. And that could be in the terms of information, that could be in, term, in terms of education, that could be in terms of how to develop this system to actually manage the information and manage the donations. So in general, we still need efforts to understanding donors' behavior. Why will you donate? What, what drives people to donate? What drives people not to donate? How can we change the behavior for people that, is, that they are kind of opposed to donating money, they just want to donate something that they own because they want to feel that connection between them and the beneficiary? How to develop educational strategies? Where do we start? Do we need to start with you guys, or we need to start with younger people, going from five years old, three years old, teaching them what a donation is, when a donation is good, when a donation is not good, especially in-kind donations. How do we foster cash donations? Galina was mentioning, if we can avoid sending stuff, and probably procuring, procuring those donations or those goods on the source or, the, or on site, that will optimize those resources. Understanding the role of the media, this is very, very important. Most of the information that people get after a disaster or after an event come from the media. And there's kind of that discontent between the media and the event. The media wants to attract people looking at the news, and they may only focus on maybe the catchy thing or the worst part of the, the event. And there have been cases, for example, in the Asian tsunami, where some villages were never covered by the media, and they never got any donation or any help at all. Physical access control. We know there are some goods that shouldn't be there, how to block them. But then we get into that dilemma. We see the news that people is not getting any help at all. And then on the other hand, we see people saying, we are not accepting more donations. So they're kind of discontent with those two parts. And finally, and I think this is where also the, the, the work could be done at the entrepreneurship level, is how to develop this information and donation management programs like Goldler. So finally, you are early to start working as an individual on these three things. 
and then develop technology and other mechanisms to help on the later three. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And um, so we are here have uh, Brent, and I'll get to him just in one minute. But to finish up uh, with Miguel, with you, can you please tell us? We have this uh, wonderful audience of young people. A lot of them are high schoolers. What would you suggest, so the next disaster strikes, what would you suggest that they actually do if they decide to help and you know, they do not have financial resources? What do you think they should be doing next? Okay, so one of the things that people do is when they don't have financial resources to donate cash, for instance. You look for what you have and you try to donate. However, in-kind donations may not be the best way to do. However, you have skills. Sometimes you can cook, sometimes you can help. You have friends in your blog. You can actually do a cook sale, a yard sale, anything that you, you can do, fundraising at your school, and then donate the cash. So that's one of the things that at the, at the young age, if you have the means to donate the cash, you can actually do. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And I'd like to also introduce you to Brent. Or in, actually, I will let him introduce himself. Uh, Brent, tell us about yourself and what are your role is in humanitarian technology and humanitarian logistics. Good. Thank you. I guess my mic's on. Um, just a warning, I'm not a, the best public speaker, but you guys have done great. Um, so I got my start, I actually studied um, architecture, and I never thought I'd get involved in humanitarian operations, but I attended an event like this at Stanford a million years ago in 1993, and it was about Bosnia. I don't know if you guys know about the conflict in Bosnia, but it was really bad, and at the time, it didn't seem like a lot of people were doing a lot to help. And so the conference was about the situation, and I felt compelled to uh, get involved, and I joined the group that hosted the conference, and I ended up working with them. And within a year, I was somehow in Sarajevo working on relief convoys, and um, it was really surreal. But for all of you, you know, sometimes there's something that just pulls you out of what you're doing in your life, and you end up compelled to help people, and it might not be your your, your, what you wish to be doing. You know, I wish I was still in architecture, but I'm in humanitarian operations. Anyway, so it's, um, this might change your life today and might, you know, you might end up up here one day, like me. <laughs> but um, so I ended up, after Bosnia, I ended up getting a master's in humanitarian operations and then I ended up working for United Nations. And I worked for a group that um, produces satellite images for other humanitarian groups to facilitate um, operational coordination in the field and to help plan uh, where to put refugee camps and things like that. So long story short, that's how I got involved in humanitarian operations and um, technology. Yeah, may I also ask you about humanitarian logistics? What are the differences of other different organizations are using NGOs or corporations for humanitarian logistics and what humanitarian logistic is? Yeah. Can you hey. please tell everyone what it is? What yeah, is it? thank you. Um, so my first job with this group was actually as a logistician, and that's a hard thing to say, logistician, a couple times. But um, it's actually planning how to get aid from point A to point B. And um, if you work for FedEx, it sounds really easy, but it's actually difficult. And um, just to illustrate the point, I did bring a Kit Kat here, and um, I'd like one of you over here to pass this Kit Kat to the back of the room but by person to person, and you can only use your left hand. So you have to, I'd like you to pass it to anyone you like, but only using your left hand and vice versa. And somehow you guys get this to the other side of the room. And, uh, oh wow, that's an interesting. Left hand. <laughs> left, oh, left. Only Sorry. can you use left hand, so, so um, no cheating. Humanitarian logistics is really tough and um, you can never expect what's gonna happen or where you're gonna end up and what sort of problems arise along the way. So, um, yeah. That this, you know, it's not easy. Larger groups, MS Doctors Without Borders and others, they can, they have more resources to improve logistics, but logistics is always a challenge. What technology is being employed to improve the logistics? What are, what are you being working with and how you, you personally, your work? Yeah, 
So I, I got involved in um, open data sharing between humanitarian organizations because as you can see, to coordinate the movement of this KitKat across the room takes, if you want to improve it and optimize it, it takes information sharing. And so information sharing frameworks and standardized ways of discussing your objectives and what you're working on, you know, is really important. And so that's, that's what I'm working on. And that's, you know, I don't know if anybody asked in the room what's the coolest thing that's going on in tech right now, humanitarian tech, and that's open data sharing that powers artificial intelligence, for example. What are the challenges of data collection? Yeah, so um, right now there's a lot of um, standard standardization um, projects going on across the humanitarian community. And the biggest challenge is standardizing how all of you communicate with one another. You know, it's not easy. And um, there's a flood of, you know, unstructured data to actually make the data structured is a big deal. And that's how humanitarian groups, they've been working on it for eight years now. There's a framework called IATI, I-A-T-I, you can look it up, IATI standard. And this is a huge project that grassroots groups and middle groups like Doctors Without Borders and UN groups are pushing really hard to improve open data sharing. Yeah, so the KitKat got to the back of the room. So so what, are, what are the lessons we should be learning from, from this exercise? What were you trying to say? Did everybody use left hand? It was hard, huh? And you didn't know where it was going to end up next and or that you'd all of a sudden have it. Yeah, or if it's going to stop in the middle and somebody yeah. will eat it. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah, no, it made it all the way. And uh, yeah. the people over there, what do we do now? Do we get it? Yeah, you can have it. <laughs> I tried to keep it cool for you. Hey, another point is that logistics is also about learning along the way that, um, you know, what's more important, a Kit Kat or a water to a refugee? And it's usually water. But it's hard to actually, you know, uh, transport water. And you might have to settle for trying to move food or move some other form of aid and you know you have to adapt so another takeaway is that you need to adapt with what you provide and how you provide it and collaborate with each other yeah and Miguel a question for you about data what have you been experienced being with the challenge of uh, getting right data in the right hands and right places at the right time uh, yeah we always uh, struggle with data um, and one of the reasons is when there's a disaster, we have like a zillion organizations working on disasters. And you can classify them in different levels. I'm not gonna get into details. But only the, the largest ones, or the one with the, with the big box and resources, can standardize, can actually keep track of the data. There are audits that they need to follow. But you have all these emerging organizations that are everywhere, and they are providing a, a big, big chunk of the help. And they don't have the time or the resources to to handle this data or even even keep it. It's not an important part from them. So we we have just a, kind of a partial view of the response, a partial view of the needs, a partial view of, of the resources available in the ground. Yeah, and Brian, the question for you, if you were to give this audience some kind of advice on their next steps in the area of humanitarian logistics. I know they're not in, like really involved in any work of that, or maybe some of you are involved, but what would be, what should they leave this um, meeting thinking about? Wow, that's, a, that's an easy question, but tough too. Um, you need to actually look at where problems exist, you know, operationally, you know, on the field, and um, they, not be, they might not be your favorite problem to solve, but if it's something that needs to get solved, you know, you, you kind of need to jump in there and take, you know, take charge of it. Um, I was recently in Iraq, and there was a group that I worked with that was, they have a bakery and they're, they're trying to, every, every week raise $500 for enough flour to run the bakery. But it's really hard to get the information across and uh, to actually make the information, be able, you know, Siri, how, how can I help refugees? To be able to get that information to your phone, to make it accessible, what these groups are doing is tough. And um, I got involved in AI because you know, there's no back end to actually ask Siri and actually have it connect to what she's doing out there. And um, so the takeaway is don't be afraid to tackle things that might be out of your level of expertise, but there's ways that you can help and you know you need to get involved if nobody else is doing it. And uh, Brent, you'll be with us tomorrow, is that right, during yeah. a hackathon? So those of you 
who will be with us tomorrow will be able to tap into Brent's, Brent's knowledge and talk to him a little bit more. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate you thank coming you. and talking to thank us you. today. Give him a round of applause. Thank you.